Hello. Uh, hello, everyone out there. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Sierra Peters. I am the uh, I'm a co curator at um, for Kumbahi's Radical Call. Um, and I'd just like to thank you all for joining us for At the Way's Edges. Um, and I'm just going to get started. Um, so this is the first of two programs. Um, we're super excited to have Jen Mergel and Demita Frazier joining us in conversation today, as well as Ariel Gray, um, perhaps a bit later. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and get started. At the confluence of Kumbahi, history was made, yet long since forming the namesake of the radical socialist Black feminist uh, Kumbahi River Collective in Boston in 1974 and co-publishing the landmark statement in 1977, uh, collective co-founder Demita Frazier remains eyes forward and basic justi justice remains elusive and capitalism's chokehold tightens and in academic echo chambers are still not talking to the crowds in the public square. So Demita has joined us today uh, to seek a flowing public dialogue and a fresh debate across generations um, about the promise and pitfalls of fa facing Black feminism today. Um, so this program will extend over two Saturdays to allow deeply probative uh, collective conversations with all of us curators, um, myself, Ariel Gray, Jen Mergel, and the attendees. Um, feel free to drop your questions in the YouTube chat space and we'll get to them um, about the issues surrounding Black feminism today. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started reading the bios and we'll get started. Um, so Demita Frazier, who co-founded the Kumbayu River Collective with Barbara and Beverly Smith, is a consulting advisor on Kumbahi's Radical Call, the exhibition that brought us all here today. Um, her experience as a Black feminist organizer grew up uh, grew upon moving to Boston, where she went on to secure her JD from Northeastern University School of Law. She's still based in Massachusetts, and she has decades of experience in anti-racism, um, sorry, anti-racist curriculum development and facilitation for organizations across the country. Jen Mergel is a Boston-born Boston and based curator uh, who has organized more than 50 exhibitions, working across uh, working for decades at museums, including the ICA Boston and the MFA in Boston. Her recent projects include Fog X Flow, um, the Boston Art Review, Public Art Issue, Area Code Art Fair, and National Workshops for Voices in Contemporary Art. Merg was a 20, uh, 2017 fellow for the Center for Curatorial Leadership and continues her studies through the Racial Equity Institute and the Cultural Equity Learning Community. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jen and Demita. Thank you so much. Hi. Yes. <laughs> uh, how are you all doing today? How's how's it going? How do you enter this conversation? Let's ask that first. Ah, uh, good. That's a good question. I have to actually say I'm thrilled. I, Jen and I, two things. When I woke up this morning, I was excited to get in this conversation because we are in a kind of lull right now where we have maybe slightly fewer crises to pay attention to. And so I think it's a great time to have this conversation that we can have without some of the huge stresses we've been dealing with in the last two years. So I'm appreciative of the moment. And <clears throat> also I wanna say, I don't know about anybody else, but I wish I had a dog. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> um. I think that also speaks a lot, uh, Demita, to your sense of care. And um, I do feel like I'm also really excited for today. Um, I want to acknowledge, um, uh, Sierra, you shared our bios and it's been an honor uh, to work with you and Ari on this project and the experience that you bring to this project in terms of your work as an artist uh, in, in the space of music. Uh, and visual arts as a uh, co-founder of Print Ain't Dead, uh, as somebody who has work in um, a contemporary space of what we could call uh, socialism um, with uh, Ujima Project, as well as with Create Well and the mutual aid work that you do. Um, it's been amazing to learn a lot from you this year. Mm -hmm. And um, it's amazing now that Ariel Gray has been able to uh, join the call. Um, I know Ari, with uh, a full-time role at WBUR and also your work as a practicing artist and curator, um, 
you've been very busy with coverage for the past 72 hours uh, in relation to uh, Boston Pride and um, uh, alternatives to, to that organization. And um, we're so grateful that uh, timing wise with all that's happening, um, we have been able to work with you, uh, not just over uh, the past uh, few months and weeks and planning for this program, but for this year. Um, and we were going to uh, just check in with ourselves in terms of how we're feeling today. And Ari, welcome. Tell, tell us how you're doing. Um, I'm, I'm good. Uh, a little trouble with my internet, but it's all fixed now. Um, earlier, I was, uh, just to everybody watching, um, earlier I was covering, I, I have been covering the Trans Resistance March and Vigil, which is happening today until around 4.30, 5 o'clock at Franklin Park. And basically this vigil was, um, this March and Vigil was created to kind of fill in the gaps that were left by Boston Pride and how they um, address our queer and trans communities of color, specifically um, trans and queer black women. Um, and uh, just really quick, I just wanted to shout out Athena Vaughn and Chastity Bowick, um, who are co-founders of um, Trans Resistance and Chastity also runs a transgender emergency fund, which provides housing, um, tries to provide housing and resources to homeless trans individuals here in uh, Massachusetts. So just to everybody watching, please go check that out because that March is exactly the type, it's, it's the reason why we're all here sitting together. This is the type of work that we do. This is the, this is just, yeah, it's just our community. So yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. Mm, thank you, Ari, um, for, for that grounding. Um, check it out and also donate, don't be passive. Um, so I'm just gonna allow us, I guess, to kind of jump into the conversation and I'm gonna ask Amita uh, to start us off. Um, could you meditate on collectivity for us? Um, just give us some of your musings. All right, thank you. Um, a couple of things come immediately to mind. And because I've been living with this word and this concept, I realized for more than 50 years, literally. I mean, it's just, um, it has been a complete process of learning, unearthing, um, being humbled and also feeling incredible hopefulness. So let me just start by saying the idea of collectivity I first got exposed to when I read in high school about collectives that had been started by African-American people in the South post-Civil War, especially if they were trying to be farmers or trying to get in, um, any kind of resources to maintain and sustain themselves. And forming collectives allowed them to figure out ways of buying and trading so that they were the embodiment of a community and not just individuals. Of course, um, there were also, it's interesting to me to think about the numbers of self-help societies and self-help groups that African-American people formed post um, civil war. And they were, there were thousands of them and how we immediately drew on um, it's interesting, I feel like it's an interesting genealogical reflection of what we remembered that people thought we'd lost, but this notion of gathering together, joining together, um, recognizing that we go further when we go together, that very great West Indian idea, I, I mean, um, West African idea, I think it's fascinating how the echoes of our more distant past still remain with us. And I also wanna say, it's interesting to me that when I think about collectivity um, in terms of not simply Kambahi, but of other ways in which I've chosen to live my life, I realized I'm a true believer. Someone described me that way a while ago and said, you know, you really believe in this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of sort of do. Um, the idea of being a cooperative member for a food cooperative. And I've been a cooperative food co-op member, you know, since 1969, Cornucopia Foods in Chicago. And the idea that I remember people in my own black community in Chicago, when I told them I joined the co-op, they were saying, oh, that's not white people's stuff. And I'm like, no, actually that's not. And so in my own little juvenile, teen, you know, late teenage, early twenties way, I remember talking with people about the concepts that we had about our own past and that the things that we believe didn't belong to us because it had been obscured or left aside or, 
you know, again, as we move further and further away from living rural lives into urban lives where they had different sorts of choices, not necessarily all great, but different ones, um, we moved away from some of, some of the more basic collective action and into the more productive, if you will, capitalist action. So you see the rise of black insurance companies, black banks, um, black cooperative societies that had to do with business and building business and entrepreneurs. Um, so in any event, by the time I and Barbara and Beverly and all the other women who were part of the grounding of comedy, by the time we came about in the 70s, um, many of us had been as socialists and as socialist thinkers looking at the ways in which interdependence was a strength. And that included and, found, and was based upon the idea that as African-American people, we have no one to waste. We have no, we don't have any extras. <laughs> we need everybody. And so the idea that we would even question the empowerment of Black women and Black women being powerful actors in the lives of our communities is just antithetical to the reality of what it means to be Black and a woman and a Black person in America. And yet we had to fight for that space because there were far too many men and women who had bought into the larger concepts. And I say larger. I wish you could see the asterisks around the word because in my mind, the capitulation to what we think of as the dominant paradigm of behavior, sort of the white heterosexist norm behavior of men and women, as people of color, the struggle to create something that's beyond that, the, the, the struggle to look at that and say, okay, that's fine. Is that really the way we want to live? Is that really the way in which we want to? invest in ourselves and create and be accountable to the divine. And I actually have to say, we are struggling as always living in a society like this one to be self-defining and, and original in our, our sort of owning and embracing what I think of sometimes as our higher angels. So the idea of collectivity, as I was saying, when we all got together in the seventies was at that point, experimental, because it's one thing to have the socialist can't and the, all the information you can have about how you create these societies, but how do you really do that in the midst of late stage capitalism? Mm -hmm. And what does that really mean? Because there are lots of questions because we were well-intended and we were very, um, I think in, in such an important way, one of the things that comes out of the, of the black feminist movement is the ways in which we encouraged one another to feel part of something. Because again, so many of us had come out of movements where we were in them, but we were apart from them. We were you know, in working with black nationalists and working with you know, finding out you know, the nature of misogynoir. Thank you, by the way, Dr. Bailey. Yeah. Um, just looking at the ways in which we, you know, we had, as Black women, we were struggling not only with misogyny and misogynoir, but with homophobia. And so we were finding ourselves strangers in our own strange land always. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't that, there were also issues of class. There were issues of color. There were issues of um, the ways in which we had even been taught about power, because that's one of the other things that we didn't really talk about um, in a deep way. When we said collective action, we knew to how to create events, we knew how to marshal forces, but the other questions about who has time right this moment to be 100% committed to this when other parts of life are interfering. <laughs> Ariel? Oh my God. Ariel, am I, am I speaking to you, Ariel? Oh my <laughs> God. Me and Sierra were just talking about this. Like, where's the time? Where oh. is the time? And I think that people yeah. think that it's no. a compliment when they're okay. like, oh my God, you're so, like, it's like, no, I sit, sleep like five hours a day. I don't think that you understand. Mm. Oh, and wait a minute. Wait, hold on. Because here's what I want to put out. You, we need to be questioning, when we say, where's the time? The other question behind that is, 
how are we choosing to use our collective time? Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. are responsive are we to the actual reality of black women's lives? So I don't know about anybody else, but I remember my twenties and oh my God, never want to live through that again or the early thirties. I mean, dealing with all of the issues of evolving your issues of mental health, issues of what it really means to feel and be empowered and making your own choices, all the things that have to do with how you're understanding love, commitment, um, friendship, all those things are up for grabs in your 20s. It was mm -hmm. drips rough. On top of all of that, there we were, you know, doing what we consider to be important work as Black feminists. And so there was no space for tiredness. There was no space for, I really can't do that right now. I'm just, no. And it led, at least for myself, and I feel like this is part of what I'm writing about, it's, it led me, let me say two things. You're already at a stage of life when you're in your 20s and early 30s of figuring out your edges, who you are, where you stand. Mm -hmm. And I was discovering, like many people, all the places that I didn't even know where I was walking. And so I'm uh, learning about myself. And so making more space for that dynamic in organizations that we're trying to create, I think is an important aspect of care. Because if we think about the organizations that we're trying to create and that we want them to be healthy and we want them to be, um, uh, the word honest is gonna come up right now, but they will, be, they will have a certain honesty to them. I think what we have to do is to remind ourselves deeply of our humanity. And we, we talk all the time about as Black women, you know, we know what we're dealing with, at least 90% of it, and it's pretty overwhelming in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. the magical also, we not to leave out the magic. However, we are tending to really also feel that we have to get everything done and it's not possible. Mm -hmm. So it's important, I think, for us to have more honest conversations about how to support one another when we need that space, when we have to make that call and say, I don't have it. How can I trade for you to do X when I, and I'll do Y? I don't have it. Mm -hmm. and, and that learning, again, that's not popular in terms of the dominant culture. So the ability to stand up for yourself and say, without apology, I'm done, I'm toast, I'm over, or I'm depressed, I can't do it, or I, you know, whatever the causes are, learning how to honor those things are, is really important part of care. So I would say, in terms of being a collective, in terms of collective action, we have to be careful and be intentional about how we define that and make, and, and also, I know we think we know what that is, and I know we think we, you know, I have to get that out. But I think we, if we map what's really involved at the thinking, emotional, uh, organizational levels in joining with other people to, to journey together, and that journeying together is going to be fraught and not a simple thing. And this is what we're signing up for. We have to be clear. And we typically are not clear about these things. We get excited, we join up, and the next thing we know, we're calling people at 2 a.m. crying and like, how did I get involved with this? So, you know. Demita, okay. can, oh, I'm done. I, I wanted to share, um, I, I dropped in the chat in, in Zoom a link that uh, Ari and Sierra shared with me as we were uh, forming our collective and it brought me back to uh, I, I should say, forming our collective work as co-curators of Combahee's Radical Call and, and working through our expectations, working through how it was with the um, planning of this uh, mm -hmm. before the pandemic and then when the pandemic hit, um, how to give ourselves space mm -hmm. and support each other. And so I really wanted to credit um, the learning I did, one, from when we very first met all together back in February of 2020 at Boston Public Library. I, I believe it was um, Valentine's Day because I remember uh, Ari walking in looking like radiantly beautiful, um, yeah. uh, dressed up that day. And yeah. you know, we, we shared a lot together 
But I remember we ended our meeting sharing information with each other, even about our astrological signs. Right. And I will say as somebody, uh, you know, a cis white woman who's worked in Boston and museum institutions for, um, you know, a number of decades, you know, I had never had a working meeting and a constructive meeting toward a, a project that involved sharing at that one level. And as we moved forward and had to rethink what could um, this project be, many of the motivations for reaching out to you in uh, December of 2019 had to do with um, feeling confused as somebody who grew up in Boston that I did not know about the Combahee River Collective's history being founded in Boston. Feeling uh, confused as a curator uh, who felt with, you know, wanting to do work in intentions of um, doing some self-educating and also building knowledge, why this history was not elevated or even further obscured. Right. And I want to also credit Ari's um, article in WBUR in June of um, 2019, right, yes, where she was elevating that history when others were not and saying right. Combahee is a collective that we need to look back on, was working with the History Project um, to, to get your pamphlets out and on the Internet and bring that forward, bring that history forward. Um, mm -hmm. It, it, it hasn't been advanced locally. Um, so I know I, I joined in this effort um, with a motivation about why is this history unknown? But mm. what I learned through this project, separate from learning history, you know, Ari and, and Sierra were sharing this document called A Tender Talk from Press Press. So I put the link in the Zoom. I wanna, I wanna encourage people to think about that in thinking about ways to work together tenderly. Yes. So it's not just subject matter, it's actually not what you're, you're working on, it's how you're working together is right. the work. And so I do feel like for me, again, approaching the space with humility and from a space of learning, um, wanna acknowledge what colleagues have been teaching me um, <laughs> across the way and um, different, different, and I don't use this word lightly, but different, um, generational approaches, as well as different, um, it, while this is a cycle that continues to repeat, you're bringing up the challenges that came up in the 70s, even section three of the statement talks about the problems yes. of, of organizing, that, that um, this is something that I find, um, you know, I would love to hear, like, for example, Sierra, you're wearing the many hats on this project as a co-curator, but also with the GEMA, also with Create Well, like what coalition, what, what collectivity is meaning to you in, in 2021? Like, I just feel like I'm continuing to learn from this yeah. conversation together. Yeah, thank you for that, for that question, Jen. Um, yes. I guess I'll just describe my background a little bit. Um, so in, oof, I think I moved to Boston in 2016 or 2017 as an adult, I like to say, um, <laughs> because living on your own is very different. Um, and from there, I had started volunteering with Ujima as well as working at Create Well Fund um, as administrative support. Um, fast forward to 2019, um, I become a fellow at Ujima and I move into a uh, more, I guess, embodied role, <laughs> I want to say, at the Create Well Fund, uh, not as an administrative support, but actually as a co-tender, which for us means um, like a program designer or, you know, um, our, all of our work is horizontal. There is no one that's higher than the other. Um, we do everything together. So co-tender just means that we are stewarding the work of, um, of creating this space together. The Create Well Fund is a uh, artistic project. Uh, I like to call it a social sculpture. It's like our effort at you know what it would look like um, to support artists through award making, through grant making that is not extractive or product-based that is actually based on the person and making sure that they're able to realize um, their most authentic artistry as well as like care for their holistic being. Um, and so I think it's great. Uh, I think our programs are great, um, but you know, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't until 2019 that we had started this effort towards moving to a more non-hierarchical space. 
Um, and that's not on anybody. Um, you know, it, most of the work was on literally one person who is um, an amazing um, founder of the organization, um, Jen, uh, also a Jen. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jen Lynn uh, Weinheimer. Um, but it was all in one person. And so once we um, had more of a team, for lack of a better term, um, we decided to move towards a more horizontal framework. Um, and that was the real education, I think, for me. I mean, I had done, I'd been in a ton of collectives um, in my youth, um, but not with, um, obviously with Ari, me and Ari are a two-person collective, and that's something in and of itself, um, but not one uh, that was this big, uh, you know, four people, five people. Um, and just as well at, you know, the Boston Dreamer Project, which is like a Black-led organization that's attempting to return the stolen wealth uh, <laughs> to uh, working class communities of color in Boston, right? Like, so these are, although it's not um, not hierarchical, I don't think that it needs to be because ultimately all of the work is inherently democratic. Um, everyone that is a part of Ujima, um, all of the voting members have one vote as to where the investment funds go and how it supports people. So whether that's um, through the CARE Fund, I'm sorry, not the CARE Fund, um, whether that's through the Ujima Fund, um, which is on its way to raising $5 million this year, um, how that money gets doled out uh, through like small business support or through, um, I'm sorry, through real estate, buying real estate, that is, a tor that is a futurity that we need to start thinking about, right? Like land stewardship, et cetera, et cetera. You know, all these different uh, modes of supporting one another. Um, and so those are the hats that I wear, as well as like being a part of uh, Printing Dead, you know, um, some, some music stuff with my friends, as well as like being a co-curator um, at this juncture. So uh, when I'm thinking about collectivity, I'm thinking about it in those frames. <laughs> uh, and that's just like for us to enter into it. Um, and I think, you know, just to pull on some of the strings that uh, Demita was talking about, because I'm thinking along a lot of the same lines. Um, I'm thinking about the fact that we institutionalize difference and that we institutionalize dehumanization, right? Like obviously, you know, this has existed in America since America's founding, right? Like how property was made, um, people as property, um, even to 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, and all of the horrors that we saw um, through the Trump administration and even now, right? Like we see that there is a way that you can institutionalize difference um, and, and categorize people's lives and the worthiness of those lives. I think that that was, you know, over the pandemic, that was one of the things that kept breaking my heart um, is just seeing like, seeing in real time, the racial calculus, like the, the hierarchies of, mm -hmm. of who gets to live and die. Um, you know, the necropolitics of it all were like really getting to me. Um, and so, you know, I don't know, <laughs> uh, like, and so when I'm meditating on collectivity, like, I just wanted to, like, kind of, like, reify this idea that Tamita brought up, which is just, like, I just know that care is a muscle. I just know that um, collectives are not always, like, we, we sometimes, uh, so I just want to say two things. Care is a muscle, and so if we can institutionalize difference, I'm not saying that institutions are the way, but I'm saying that through my work, I have found that we can inst institutionalize care. Mm -hmm. um, and that being important. Again, I don't know that institutions are the way, but I do know that there is a way that we can abundantly take care of each other and ourselves, as Demita was talking about, without it being a constant, um, I don't wanna say like juice, but like without you being juiced all the time, without juicing artists, without juicing people of color, without juicing workers, like there is a way for us to all get to where we need to be without that. Mm. Um, and so, uh, the second thing, this idea of collectives, anything can be a collective. So I don't necessarily want to like, um, you know, romanticize collectives because there is a, there could be a cooperative of people that's trying to like drill some oil out the ground. And that's also a collective, right? Like, um, so I want to just like make sure that like, when we're talking about these things, um, that we're, that we're doing it with that lens. Um, and I think, you know, I'm just gonna stop on this point. I just love, Demita, that you brought up uh, the Black Mutual Aid Societies um, mm -hmm. that have existed um, throughout time. Um, mm -hmm. I love that you brought up, you know, the Black women that have been, you know, disrupting um, architectures of social, political, and I don't know, like material space, just through their, not just through their being, but through their work, through their care work. I just, I loved mm -hmm. all that you were saying. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. 
that's mm-hmm. that's where I, that's what I got. <laughs> awesome, awesome. I I wish I, <laughs> there were like a thing over my head that was like applauding because the applause sign is on. No, absolutely. <laughs> and just really quickly, I want to just note something. Um, we are actually, despite the pandemic, I think we need to give ourselves some credit for having created, and I say you folk, because you've been so heavily involved in making sure that something evolved in in spite of the pandemic, that we were able to persist and continue in the face of a situation that, by the way, is not over yet. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to put that in there. And also one other thing that you said just now, um, Sierra, that really, capture something for me is the fact that collectives are not about the size or the number of people involved. It really has, I think, and I'm maybe I'm maybe putting words in your mouth, but just let me say, it has to do with intentionality and the intent upon organizing. Mm -hmm. I think um, because again, People come to collectivity and collective action with the same kinds of ideas that they bring to groups that people say we're like a family. Well, Mm. you know, really? (laughs) I don't know if I could be a part of any of that, but sincerely, I mean, these are loaded terms and terms that are loaded with meaning and and important and and import. So I think just what you said, so much of what you were saying about the number of things you're involved with, Sierra, and the array of chances to work in a collective fashion. Mm. I hope you all are making some notes and and making some work around this because interdependence and collectivity are going to be what's up for humanity. Mm-hmm. We, I mean, the handwriting is not on the wall. I think now the carving is in the wall. And so I think, um, just even introducing these concepts and ideas again and again and refining them and reiterating them and making them a- and actualizing them like Ujima and mm-hmm. like, which I think by the way, is it print dead? dead print? Printing dead, printing dead. Oh and God. I just wanted to point out, you know, cause I think that that idea like keeps coming up of like um, grind culture or something like that. I think that that's what we're like getting at there with like, um, uh, all the things like the only reason why I'm able to do these things is because of people like Ari who yes. make sure that like when I'm overwhelmed and I can't do it that I can take space from things at a certain point like we don't necessarily it's not mm. always 50 50 sometimes it's 70 30 mm. sometimes it's 100 zero depending exactly. on what's going on in our lives so that was another thing that I just wanted to like lift up is that it's not necessarily like the thing it's like mm-hmm. how we hold the thing as you were saying yeah. Yes. And I think one of the most important things that we have pushed, especially with doing this project and that, you know, I think we've challenged the BCA to do is to not be focused on the end product. We need to be focused on the relationship building that gets us to that end product. Like, um, and even with Print Ain't Dead, like, we don't really have deadlines. Like, we don't, we don't prioritize a product over the relationship that Sierra and I have with each other, over the relationship that we build with people in our community, we are not focused on an end product. And I think that's where kind of this capitalist mindset comes into play is that it's always, the focus is always on the thing and never the path that gets you to the thing. You know, we'll get, we know we'll get there eventually, but what's more important to us is um, how do we get there? Do we get there in a way that's making us feel fulfilled? Are we getting there in a way that gives us rest and time to think about why we're even on this path? And, you know, I think the other thing too, Demita, what you were saying about um, everybody wants to be a part of a collective, but people don't realize like this is, this ain't a book club. You know what I mean? <laughs> this isn't, this it's not something where, you know, we, we, we meet once a month and we sit in somebody's living room and it's real cute. And no, this takes work and beyond that it takes having hard conversations with each other it takes being honest with each other so like Mm -hmm. a family you fight with people in your family there are Mm -hmm. times where you may not be speaking to someone in your family right so it's like (laughs) 
part of the collective, like uh, learning how to work collectively is learning how to engage in the process of disagreeing with each other in a way that's productive, um, not taking things personally, which is hard to do when you're part of a group. Um, and also being willing to have those hard conversations. A lot of people are scared of confrontation and they don't wanna have those hard conversations with people that they're close to or that they work with. And um, one of the things I think I've learned most with Sierra is that, you know, we've had a couple of talks where we've had to talk through like our differences in opinion or how we approach something. And what happens? We come, our relationship gets stronger mm -hmm. every time. And, and, and that's moment. what we focus on. And that's, I love that you just said that, Ari, because the thing that I'm getting, that, that I'm hearing, and something that I wish that we would talk about more often is like, how we disagree is more important than that we disagree. Like this fear of disagreement, especially within, I think like, you know, I always hear like the bifurcation of the left, the left is so disorganized, blah, 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 blah. And I don't even identify as leftist, but I think that like, you know, there's something to the fact that, you know, people, you know, individually or collectively need to be able to engage in principled struggle and mm -hmm. in principle dialogue, because that is true democracy. Mm -hmm. The idea that you cannot have conversation and that you cannot disagree. I don't want, you know, I don't want to call it the other thing, but I'm just saying it's not democratic, you know? So I think that, you know, you know, the F word, I don't want to say it, but you know, it, yeah. if you disagree, then like, what else can it be? Um, and so thank you, Ari, because the consequences to, you know, what happens when, you know, we don't come together. Like we see the, that the world is opening up. How much money do people get for their damn checks? Like, you know, um, yeah. for, for the, you know, all the, for all the struggle and all the harm and all the death that happened last year, like what, uh, what came of it except, you know, clubs are open, schools might be open in September. Like what, what actually came of this year? Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, and can I, I'm sorry, Jen, did you want to say something before I left in again? Well, I, I will just say this, line of um, really constructive thinking is reminding me of how Print Aid Dead had hosted um, as part of your online program called Black Feminist Study Hall, a really great program where we focused on the writings of Alexis Pauling Gum and the focus of uh, sistering as a verb in acknowledgement of Tony K. Pambara and how um, this idea of, uh, you know, the metaphor of family can be problematic in the sense of um, in quote unquote professional workspaces, those aren't professional relationships, those, those types of um, debates around, um, you know, intention and um, actually showing care for one another beyond the professional aren't always welcome in, in the professional space and in this collective space. So certainly over our past year together, we've had those really, um, critical learning moments and listening moments with each other. And um, I do feel like there was something so constructive in that, that notion of sistering as a verb. And it was an intergenerational acknowledgement of learning from a, a mentor. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I found that as a really valuable touchstone. And so my, my thinking um, just goes to um, how much I've appreciated the writing, the creative writing, the theorizing, um, the sort of intellectual attention to this act that um, is, is not separate from self-identification. It's actually fundamental to mm -hmm. self-identification. So um, I, I just wanted to bookmark the work even prior to this, this project together as something that's been learning building from here. Um, Demita, uh, yeah, the the next response to that idea of sistering, I would love, uh, or not sistering, um, what, what Sierra was saying before, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sorry about that. Well, and you know, again, I just realized something. Um, when we talk about things being triggering and we talk about things that may set us off, um, I have to say, one of the things that, the reason why I'm loath to describe things as family mm -hmm. is just because of the complications that I think we've all come to understand about what that actually means for so many people, not necessarily a shared experience along any dimension. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it also goes to, as we continue to try to define what we mean in this moment by family, what we mean in this moment by collectivity, by self-care, by group care, I think one of the things I've learned, and we certainly learned this in the era of the 60s and 70s is about seizing the narrative 
-hmm. and making sure that um, you no longer will just see to others a description of your life experience, of what your dreams are, of what your hopes are. The challenging part, of course, is how do you make new wine from old wine? We've all been acculturated in this culture and a variety of cultures. We have lived in the generational gap that we've each lived in. There are lessons that are to be mined from that, but there's also a lot of dreck to be dropped. How do you know what to drop? How do you know what to keep? And also as we combine across all of the, the avenues of difference that we exist in in this country, the things that you learn across cultural lines about what family means, about what it means to be collective, about what it, about the bitter as well as bittersweet lessons of what happens when you attempt to combine for, I don't know, political actions. And by the way, um, Sierra, you said you're not sure if you're a leftist. I think you're a progressive and I certainly know that I'm a radical. So forget left and right because I'm a left-handed person, but I don't know. Anyway, I just want to go on and say what I think, two, two things. Jen, when you said the thing about learning about how people um, in professional realms do not take the time to relationship build in a meaningful way, because that's also very white American slash European. Let's get down to the business and all the treachery and human in, in human dimensions that lie just below the surface are allowed to take over. The, 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 the bullying, the deal making with quotes around that, that you see so spread across all, just all sorts of interactions with humans in America. We're talking about trying to build something different from what we already know. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think we need to make sure that we're more humbled by that because that's why there's so much pain around people attempting to be good collective members, but finding that they can't attend to their own needs and be good collective members. Mm -hmm. I think it's also really important to recognize when you said that Sierra about sometimes it's hundred percent to zero, 50 to 50, Sounds so much like a marriage, I have to tell you. Um, but that, well, you know, relationship, right? I think learning how to flow with that, how do you sit with your resentment when it's two of you who need that time off and you're a two person collective? How do you deal with, and so the intention in terms of how you process what happens how you engage, and I think, Ari, you really said it, it's how you, how you engage is as important as whatever is the beef is that you're dealing with, with the tofu. So I think it's really, um, I think it's important from a process perspective and for a growth perspective mm -hmm. to always think about the nature and the quality of the relationship you're building as you work together. I think I've told you this story mm -hmm. before. When we started, um, Casamir Navasquez back in the 70s, it's the battered women's shelter here in New England. Um, we were a group, I mean, we're talking mixed nuts. We're talking about ex-nuns, nuns, priests, um, people who were organizing prostitutes in the South End and dealing with sex trafficking, um, high school students. We were, it was an array. And what was amazing was it was my first experience of watching someone a priest who was there, who was actually no longer in the priesthood, who could not co-sign with us our support of abortion rights that mm -hmm. far. And he said he, 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 he was quiet and let's call him Jim. But at the end of the meeting where we were talking about voting, he said, I have to tell you, I have to abstain and this is why. And I did not agree with what he was saying. I was like, well, okay but it was the way he talked, mm -hmm. speaking from his heart, speaking from where he was at that moment, it never left me. I saw that and I said, that's how you do this. Mm -hmm. He didn't ask anyone to do anything that they couldn't do. And he certainly wanted to not be asked that for himself. And he was honorable and intentional. And I, again, will disagree with him forever um, because I believe a woman's right is a woman's right to choose, but it was a real lesson in learning how to disagree and how to sit with it because there are feelings that are attached to it. How do you manage that? How do you, how do you deal with that? So in any event. Hmm. I, I love how we've 
um, surfaced a few different metaphors so far for this notion of coalition. You know, one, what we were talking about, sistering, we use the metaphor family. I love, uh, Demita, I hope people don't miss your brilliance as a comedian and your way with language when you were describing, we were mixed nuts, right? It, it, like the, the individuals of difference coming together. And yes. Sarah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about small worlding because that's another beautiful metaphor that you brought forward that doesn't depend on family. Um, and it, it, it sort of a notion of scale. And I think it's one that could be really useful in this conversation. Mm. Yes. Well, I don't want to take credit for that because wow. that is the, those are the words of Barbara Christian yeah. mm -hmm. um, who talks about um, how, and, and this is my interpretation of it. So it's not necessarily something that I would say is in the book. Um, but when I was um, thinking about it, you know, I, I think in the very beginning of the pandemic, um, talking with my family every day, talking with my closest friends almost every day, um, a lot of 3 a.m. FaceTimes and very late night texting sessions, um, I was uh, having a conversation with a friend um, called Deland, uh, Justin Ville, who is, you know, an amazing theorist and uh, archaeologist. Um, and, and this was a, one of the conversations that we have, which is like, Ultimately, and especially, you know, in the wake of people suddenly realizing, or not suddenly realizing, but in the popularization of mutual aid project, of mutual aid as a project, um, you know, we were just uh, trying to find a way to describe um, the fact that like our small picture can change in order to change our big picture. Mm -hmm. And it's really just a concept of like being the change that you want to see. Um, mm -hmm. Right, like, uh, um, but a lot less corny, I'd like to say. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's not necessarily anything that's super uh, uh, lofty or forgone, but it's really just about, you know, how we, how we organize. It's not necessarily about things being, you know, on a super grand scale or us, you know, I think at the time there was like uh, a lot of what I like to call like manic panic, um, a lot of like mania around um, black lives, around, you know, like everything that was going on in the streets and like, uh, um, Obviously, you know, a lot of beautiful, amazing organizing being done. And also, I think for us um, at the time, recognizing that the people that were holding us down, um, the people that are making sure that you're eating, the people that are making sure that you have groceries in your house, the people that are um, calling to check on you to see if you're good, the people that are actually helping you keep your mental health in check, mm -hmm. um, were the people that were most close to us, were our neighbors. Um, and uh, and so, you know, definitely, you know, indebted to those people, indebted to uh, um, what I like to call, you know, again, like these are the words of Barbara Christian, this is like a black feminist ethics of care, right? Mm -hmm. Like black people, again, are always disrupting <laughs> um, in these in these various ways. Um, and so um, when you see, you know, um, when you see, you know, folks just getting together, putting a fridge on the, putting a fridge on the corner, you know, you, you're, you're literally seeing, you know, Audre Lorde embodied. Um, you're seeing, you're seeing all these things, or at least for me, I was seeing, you know, all of the theory that I was reading embodied. And that was something that personally, like, um, something of this scale I hadn't had to face. And I don't think, you know, again, like this is a once in a lifetime thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, like this idea, I mean, Ari is so into, um, uh, mycelium and, mm -hmm. and mushrooms. And I just think about rhizomes and like, uh, how poetic it was that, you know, like, like the integrated root systems that we were all just like um weaving together in order to like create to sustain one another for for nothing else but you know sustenance and um stability and sustainability seems like such an important point to come to i know you talked about that also as we were chatting um sierra and i i think through um the challenges of this work on on when you were saying if we if we look at this at a smaller lens how can we expand that out, um, which raises these questions. Demita, you brought up like here we are in late stage capitalism, like here are these realities, like the, this is the, we're making new wine from the old, right? So there's, we're not in a vacuum. There's this condition around us as we're trying um, to think about this work. And um, we had noted, you know, even in conversations around black feminisms, uh, we, we use the phrase in the writing about this event, the chokehold of capitalism, that there, there are commodifications of, um, of these intentions. Um, there are these big systems that we're contending with as well. A class is another one. Um, and I'm, I'm just, you know, especially Demita, like 
when you were really staking a claim as like a radical socialist uh, black feminist. Like, so I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about your thoughts on like the class issues, the larger system here and um, you know, your observations past and present. You know, this is really a good point to bring, to think about this because one of the other issues that came up in terms of acting collectively um, is recognizing where we're each starting. And the thing about social class, at least for Black folk, um, in, the term, in terms of when I was first beginning to really look at it, 60s and 70s, is there was a lot of hype about what class really meant. Um, everybody in the African-American community where I grew up was middle class, you know, that was clearly not true. And the reality is the way in which American, USians <laughs> talk about um, class is unique to us because like everything else that emanates from white supremacy, there's a lot of lies built right in it. <laughs> so, you know, structured on lies, built upon lies, and leading to the complications that we deal with when we try to come together and work together. So I will say we struggled in Kambahi to try to articulate and to, and to push against folk who were like trying to dismiss us because we were intellectuals and obviously from the middle or upper middle class, a bunch of bourgeois black women and nothing could have been further from the truth. Um, we were everything from me, which was the marginal class, the hustler class to people who were lower middle class, working class. And a few of us, maybe one or two of us were from real money. And the thing was the conversation that we had with regard to class iterated an idea that African-American people in America, in the United States, have a very complicated relationship to class and our understanding of our own class situation. And that it's going to be a continually unfolding story as we were moving where we came from, Barbara Beverly and I and the rest of us, born in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, to folks who are now like Airy, like um, Sierra are younger by one or two generations. May and all of us went. To, all of us, those of us in the past, went to segregated schools. We all went to segregated schools, either K through eight or sometimes K through twelve. That is a different experience than when you grow up being integrated into public schools or private schools, where you're one of one or one or two or whatever. It changes how you see the world. It affects the way you experience your own social class. And without a conversation across generations, it creates an extraordinary opportunity for misunderstanding, mm -hmm. an extraordinary opportunity for um, misapprehension. And because we don't have a, a unified field for talking about class in the African-American community, when we come together from different cities, from different regions, the class issues are obscured oftentimes by other things or not surfaced in a way that can help us deal with them. So I would say, um, like most Americans, like most USians, we have some real conflicts and confusions about class position, class alliances, class allegiances. We are um, in a kind of disarray, I have to say. Mm -hmm. And one other thing I would also say is that White, cap, white supremacy capitalism is all about obscuring clarity. You don't need, you don't, you shouldn't be clear because the longer you're unclear, the more chance we have for the mischief we want to perform. So it's really, um, when I look at some of the black economists, um, especially if they're not conventional economists, but are in fact have a radical or progressive perspective. And we think about, you know, the black socialists like CLR James and others who articulated very clearly a certain class perspective, we have to remember, we are still struggling as African-American people. And I do, I, I'm speaking strictly as African, as an African-American person and for in that community, we still struggle with the tug towards late stage capitalism as if it's going to save us. Hmm. We also are very clear that we need to have our hustle on to survive in it. Mm -hmm. And yet at the other side of it too is a wondering, a dreaming, could something different 
be possible? Do we really have to live this way? Do we have to be caught up in this way of living that on so many levels feels antithetical to values that we might want to cultivate or hold? So um, that's what I think about class right now. I'm, I'm still struggling to try to figure out um, the conversations I need to have as a thinker and a writer with people who can further my own learning and understanding. And the more I look, by the way, I was just gonna say one other thing that I'm fascinated by is when you look outside of the United States and you look at radical movements like the microfinancing movement, mm -hmm. um, when you look at all the other models, the kinds of things that Ujima is doing, we know that these things are possible. The question going back to where you started, Jen, is in this context, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. Because of white supremacy, as I said, they're not about our survival. They're not about our improvements. They're not about any of that. They're not about that life. So trying to create institutions, and oh, by the way, Sierra, institutions are not bad, unfair, anti-democratic, racist, authoritarian institutions are terrible. But institutions are structures that you get to build upon. And if you build them with fairness and you build them bones inside and out, dedicated towards the democratic ideals, then they're not bad in, themselves, in and of themselves. Hmm. So I, okay, I'm running out of energy. I guess I'm at the end. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious, following that, you were talking about creating, creating within that. And um, I even think about the, the metaphor um, when Sarah, you introduced me to, to Barbara Christian's concept of small worlding, that it's a creative act. Um, and so um, one of the things that I thought was so beautiful, Demita, when you, you were titling um, this two-part conversation series at the Waves Edges, you, you were using these, these um, beautiful metaphors of sort of interwashing salt waters and fresh waters, um, like where, like literally Combahee itself leads into the Chesapeake and leads it out to, to the oceans um, yes. from which, uh, you know, Harry Tugman's ancestors have come across, right? And, and there is um, such be so many beautiful metaphors and so much beautiful writing. Like Ari, you're a beautiful writer as well. There, there's this power in creativity. Um, I'm thinking of like Christina Sharp's In the Wake. I'm thinking about um, the metaphors that we're talking about with water um, and just poetic writing, poetic thinking and, and creativity. And um, just, you know, your Demita, but of course Ari and Sierra, um, your thoughts of wearing multiple hats as creatives, as mm -hmm. well as, um, as of course, critical thinkers and uh, organizers and, um, you know, uh, uh, small world makers. Um, mm -hmm. Like how, how you see that role of creativity as um, sustaining you when you're saying like five hours a night, like, or you're running on fumes or you're having to, to, to um, like never take your foot off the gas and keep the hustle going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I make a big vote for Barbara Christian's idea of small, small worlding? The thing is, um, and I'll stop very quickly, um, the grandiosity of American political expression is obnoxious. Mm -hmm. When we think, we look at a problem and we think we have to solve it and it can be solved by simply putting a thousand people or a hundred thousand people on the streets. Mm. And that we, or that, you know, if we do X or Y, it'll be simply done. It, that's not the way in which change really takes place. And this idea that the one person comes with the one good idea, and even if they collectivize with several other people, as if an idea can catch fire so easily and change the world, I'm here to tell you, it doesn't really happen quite that way. The real metaphor for change takes place with the small people in the small world on the ground. Mm -hmm. Learning how to understand, I, I said, I made a joke recently, a joke I suppose was bittersweet. Black feminism didn't really take. When I look at the numbers of people, the fact that, by the way, Jen, the fact that Kambahi isn't celebrated, is it? I mean, it is celebrated in certain small bubbles in this mm -hmm. world, you know, the National you know, Women's Studies Association Conference really celebrated us and, you know, different folks in different venues. But 
we're talking bubbles here. We're not talking about the larger membrane that stretches across a community. We're talking about a tiny slice in many ways of a community. And when I think about the ways in which I see African-American women operating with one another in the so-called popular culture, I'm like, mm -hmm. Black feminism did not take. I feel like when I see how that, that jealousy and resentment and fighting over men is something that's being touted as really important to be happen happening with Black women, it's, it's daunting to me because we're not talking about finding love and care and relationship. We're talking about somebody going into the club and getting a man. It's like, what? Why? Mm. How, what? What? So pardon me for losing it for a moment there, but I really feel that it's so often we thought that by articulating a vision and speaking truly not to, you know, anything super abstract actually about the lives of black women, but in fact, we're talking about the material reality that we live with, talking about how we could empower ourselves to change the narrative, to shift it, to get ourselves in a place where we regarded ourselves with the utmost care, where every sister was loved and cared for, and by virtue of the fact of being a black woman, as we said, inherently valuable. Yeah, well, what I'm seeing sometimes in the, in the dominant culture, and I don't know who's running that game, you know, capitalism is so tricky. When I see what even sometimes passes as quote, feminism, close quote, it's troubling because I'm not seeing the love and care of black women, the unmitigated respect without, res you know, without reservation. I, I'm, it's, I think I'm sometimes, I don't despair because I know that life, take, it takes a long time for things to change, but I look at that and I think that's pretty daunting. That's a lot to try to resist in, in a reality that um, needs to be resisted. Stop. All right, Sierra. <laughs> yeah, we've we've talked about this, um, and I think this is a conversation that we've had a lot, um, and that we've struggled with sometimes, um, as a space that has always made it our mission not not always made it our mission, but our mission is to obviously center um, specifically the voices of queer and trans women of color but specifically black trans women. Um, and even within black feminist spaces, there's a lot of homophobia, there's a yeah. lot of transphobia. Um, and so our black trans sisters, our black queer sisters do not feel safe or welcome in a lot of these spaces that we say are for us. Um, mm -hmm. um, and then we talk about the whole, you know, I, I feel like so much of what we consider either self-care or building relationships is all somehow connected to like spending money, um, being a capitalist. I mean, we talk about Beyonce, right? With, with like, as Rosie <laughs> the Riveter, right? Like there's nothing inherently feminist about Beyonce. I feel like the things that people attach to her are sometimes interpreted as feminist, but to me, there's nothing feminist about being a capitalist. Um, and encouraging capitalism within your community. Like that's not, to me, that's not radical. Um, or, or wait, Ari, also not questioning. I mean, she could still yeah. be it, but I don't get the sense that there's any questioning going on. Right. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that's that's the thing. And, uh, you know, this whole like girl boss culture that I have brought up where everybody wants to be a girl boss and, mm -hmm. you know, black women are um, starting businesses, which is, which is wonderful. That's a great, I love to see that. But at the same time, we can't, we can't want to open a business and exploit our community to run that business. We can't right. open a business and not want to pay people above minimum wage so that they can, uh, uh, you know, pay that support their lives, support their livelihood. So that's, I feel like the money thing, it always gets in the way with people. People are so focused on making money on hustling on getting by because it's what we've been taught to focus on that mm -hmm. it obscures the real conversation that we need to be having with each other, which is like, we are never going to take away. We, we can't separate racism and, and capitalism. Like we just we can't, we can't, we can't, we have to address both. And I feel like right now in a lot of feminist spaces, 
we want to address the racism, we want to address the sexism, but we don't want to address the capitalism, we don't want to address the classism um, mm-hmm. or the transphobia, homophobia that is happening within our own our own communities. Right, and but also just to go back to that too, it's really funny that we're talking about the, um, if you look at the history of African-American people around all these issues, homophobia, transphobia, misogynoir, all of them, we are, as a survive, as a group of people trying to survive, have always tried to have our hustle on like survival. That means that things get left to the side, unfortunately, that should be center and should be centered in our experience. But it is not a simple, people are, in, there's people who are engaging in overt shows of capitalism who don't have money, who don't have it together. So it's performative, it's, you know, it's the play. It's, and it's, who's got the time when, if you, I said this to my sister when I was visiting her in Chicago, you cannot, you cannot, cannot, cannot be getting your hair done for $300 and not making sure that you've got food for your kids. It wasn't her, by the way. But that's my point, is we, we get involved in some of the games, the games that capitalism wants us to play. And we also get drawn in to supporting one another in our own capitalist dreams. So that 300 bucks is for the sister who's running that salon who's trying to get over. So we have a lot of inter- a lot of things that are interconnected that it's easy for those of us who are intellectuals or who have good jobs or whatever to be able to have a critique. And yet it's the people who are on the ground who are most affected in ways negative with regard to capitalism, but who don't always ask those questions. That's always the struggle, right? Mm-hmm. It's always the struggle. Uh, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think I'm having a little bit of difficulty entering this conversation because um, one, I just wanna say um, echoing Ari, um, we very much strive to create safe spaces for everyone. Um, we definitely resist you know, this idea of like, uh, saviorism or like soul authorship or like we're the only people like we always try to do things collectively um, with other people and sisters in our community so how does that look you know cross-pollination at every possible chance um, but I think like when it comes to um, how we understand popular culture you know how we understand um, how we understand other friends in our community um, I think <laughs> I don't want to be like too, you know, too, I don't want to push back too much, but I think that there is like, I, I'm struggling with um, how we talk about and critique, um, how we how we talk about and how we critique other Black women. Um, I think that, you know, for me, like, you know, e- even the Beyonce conversation, like I have a little bit of difficulty with, right? And it's not because it's Beyonce. Um, it's not because of her as a figure, as a public figure, but I think in general, you know, um, we, there is a way in which, you know, we come down harder and I'm not saying anybody here specifically, but in general, we come down harder on black women than we do other people, you know? Um, And that's not to say that like, Britney didn't get it as hard. That's not to say that like, you know, other other pop stars didn't get it as hard. Um, But I I try to be careful with how, how I talk about in general, other, how other black people, move through white supremacy because ultimately um it's their experience is not my experience and i know you know things that i have had to struggle with as a black person growing up in massachusetts um that i know that other people probably won't understand like you know who i used to be when i was younger and also understanding that like those were things that i had to grow out of and those were things that i had to learn um and if it hadn't been for other black femmes in my community um both elders and people you know who are my contemporaries um that were able to to talk to me, mm-hmm. um, I I would not be the person I am today. Like very simply, um, I think you know, in general, <laughs> uh, you know, when I think about uh, creativity, you know, the outcomes of witnessing, like what it means to document as a manifestation of witnessing, um, I think that it's this um this this conversation here right like we're, we're all having conversations about things that we're seeing and how we're processing them um and then we make beautiful works out of it um mm-hmm. just as everybody else uh just just as everybody else does um you know 
so so I'm still processing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, I, I'm I am always super inspired by Sadia Hartman because I love her work um, as both an archivist and also as a writer who attempts to, um, through her work, uplift the stories of the chorus of the people that would be forgotten if it weren't for her or not if it weren't for her, I'm sorry, people who would be forgotten or lost to the archive, um, mm -hmm. whose narrative she uplifts with literal scraps of information. Um, people who, you know, popular culture might say don't inherently have value um, to, and people who, to be honest, like people who lived in the slums, people who were probably prostitutes, people who were sex workers, people who, you know, um, were moving in the world in ways that we might find um, uncouth or people who are moving in through the world in ways that we might find to be, um, I don't have a word, uh, but, you know, just, just probably not, uh, uh, people who move through the world in ways that were against the grain, I wanna say. Um, and also, can I just I say something to you, Sierra? It's yeah. Demita. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about my people. Mm -hmm. That's what you're talking about. You're talking about where I come from. Mm -hmm. That's why I feel comfortable being critical because that's exactly where I come from. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's always troubling to me is, not troubling, but just as, as we're talking, um, it's, there's a lot of ways to honor all of who we are, so many ways. My issue has to do with um, how a system that's not us, we engage in, we engage with in ways that don't benefit us except financially. And so that's my issue. And I think about the fact that it's like nobody wants to cry. I don't want to jam anybody's hustle. You know, I'm from that. But I also understand that nihilism is real. Mm -hmm. And caring about the souls of others is real. Mm -hmm. And being willing to capitulate to the dominant paradigm, which has not seen us in any way different from the moment they met us in West Africa. Mm -hmm. They've met us and seen us in a certain way and they decided to project that image across time. Mm -hmm. And now, because we're, we're smart, we can sell you right, we can sell it right back to you. You wanna play like that? We can play with you. And yet in the end, in the end, we have to always remember, we have to remember how we want to control the narrative, mm -hmm. not have to control us. So that's the only, that's where I'm coming from, is mm -hmm. having been somebody from the street, and I can speak to it in more ways than I really think is appropriate on this, in this medium. Um, <laughs> the thing that I think is so important is that being able to interrogate our reality at every mm -hmm. level and doing it, by the way, I don't be hating Beyonce. I'm not hating her. Not just, it doesn't have to do with Beyonce. I think just no, in general. No, 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 of course, no, not just yeah. Beyonce. We can talk about a whole bunch of people. Cause yeah. I'm like, in India Ari gets no play because she's too plain, as my mother said. That girl's too plain. She ain't going to get no play. I mean, that's what, okay, I'm just saying that's what was said on 89th and Cottage Grove. So I think what's so interesting, though, is that as we're talking about this, what I love is that we're talking about it because so much happens that never gets discussed. And I feel like, it's, for example, that's why I really decided to speak up and say, look, you're talking about where I come from. That's why I love Sadia Hartman too, because she does, there's no playing. This is about everyone's human reality. Mm -hmm. Human reality is not all wonderful. It is, it re it's, re mm -hmm. it's real, but there are things that we don't want to replicate. There are ways of being with each other, which we need to check it out look at ourselves, be careful, because we are some of the most tender people, the most tender. And I don't think we give each other enough space for that. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. No, and I hear you 100%. I hear you 100%. Um, 
about the tenderness and about like, you know, I would love to, you know, stay on this subject where we're just like loving on Sadia because I do yeah. think that there that we need to be writing more again about like people that aren't necessarily, um, you know, the victors of history, um, mm -hmm. right? Especially like women of that time. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that it was so apt that, you know, she's writing, you know, in 2019, 2020 about women from a hundred years ago. Right. It was such a beautiful, uh, I just thought that that was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, no, every thread that you're talking about, I love. Um, I think that in general, like, I want to talk about those girls way more than I want to talk about Beyonce. <laughs> yeah, right? No, I understand. Yeah. Oh. What yeah. I wanted to say to the Beyonce piece, too, is like, I, I definitely think that there are times for us to um, examine when we're perhaps being overly critical of Black women and how we behave, what we buy, what we spend our money on. Like, I do feel like there is um, like a microscope on how we choose to spend our money, how mm -hmm. we choose to do our hair, um, all this other stuff. And then I think that there is also a very real need to mm -hmm. look at people that I'm, I don't even want to say Beyonce's name anymore because I'm over yeah. it. Like, no. we, have, we have to acknowledge that white supremacy does not need white people to operate and that there are That's a lot true. of black people who are right. intentionally upholding white supremacy because it benefits them financially. Absolutely. And I think that's kind of like the the line that we have to make sure that we tow is like, when do we reserve? Like, I want to reserve mm -hmm. my compassion and 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 care and, um, and all that stuff for people in my community like that I can the black women in my community who I know I can touch or who I know are willing to to at least listen to another point of view I'm right. not as interested um in reserving that care for black folks who are like intentionally and and again it's it's it there's a difference between needing to participate in white supremacy and intentionally participating in white supremacy when you have an excess of stuff and excess of wealth and excess of fame and excess of power. Mm -hmm. um, so and I don't yeah, think it's between participating in capitalism and being a capitalist, right? Exactly. Because exactly. we all not everybody gets to be a capitalist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 all, we all participate in capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, choices. Yeah, we have we have no choice. But it's like, okay, when you when you get to someone like Jay-Z or Beyonce, it's like, okay, yes, you had to participate in capitalism to get to where you are. But um, where does your car, not continue, not even continued participation, but continued like, like you are actively, um, what do you call it? Actively promoting. Yes. What I mean, the, the, the system. So it's like, it's, it's a difficult conversation. It is yeah. because just like for some people that is liberation. And that's like the difficult part for me is right. that unfortunately for some people that is liberation. Unfortunately, right. yes. And that liber that liberation is predicated on somebody else's oppression. Like exactly. that's how capitalism and then, works. And, yeah. and a fantasy, since you know, there's mm -hmm. only one Jay-Z. Okay, and there's exactly. only one. That is a to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> that is a chance in the like, you know, like that is a, a Starburst, like a Beyonce and Oprah, a Jay-Z, that is like a one in a million. Right. Mm -hmm. so, Byron, Nick Cannon, all those folks we're not even Byron. mentioning now. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, okay. It's 420. Sorry. I guess really. No. I think, I think this is a, a, a really important conversation. And I just wanted to, to note for um, Sierra, I put uh, Sadia Hartman's wayward lives and, and you were like talking about that word and like wayward, I thought was so beautifully chosen by Hartman um, right. as in the, it's also a way, right? It may not be um, a, uh, you know, hegemonically prescribed way, but it is a way. And she, she actually chose to invest in how do we flesh out and how do we describe mm -hmm. what that way is and this way is, and, and that it's a small way, like as, as Tamita was saying. Um, I also think I, it would be interesting to end our conversation with a, um, our part one of our conversation as we continue part two with maybe a bridge, but um, I'm curious about um, issues of disruption and mm. like the disruptive act, it, not being destructive, being constructive, being um, in like, I think of legacy Russell's glitch feminism, the idea of there being like a break in the digital system being something that legacy described as 
being able to embody different selves as, you know, a black femme queer woman born in, you know, the 1980s and growing up in the digital age. Like um, there are certain disruptions, like 2020 has, has um, been a platform for a number of occasions to disrupt constructively. And I'm, I'm very curious about your thoughts on what you consider like what are avenues for constructive disruption? Like even your participation in the last 72 hours, um, Ari, like your writing as well as then you're following what's been happening um, in structures like uh, Pride. Um, but just just thinking about uh, Kambahi as, as laying down ground, you were saying, Demita, like, you know, we were um, figuring out and navigating problems, but you were also, I feel like that statement was a disruptive act. Like okay. there may, there may have been like NBFO, but like, there's another way yes. so we're going to, we are going to break in order exactly. to define. Exactly. Um, and I want to ask, actually, thank you for the segue for this, because the question I wanted to ask as it relates to kind of where we, where we go when we're talking about being disruptive, um, never thought about this until maybe three or four years ago, but the issue around taking a radical, making a radical stand, mm -hmm. taking a radical stance for us, we were to a woman, to a person, risk embracing in that group. Mm -hmm. Anybody who was risk averse actually fell away over time mm -hmm. because it was very difficult for people were finding out where their edges were what they could tolerate, what they could stand. And we were unliked and disliked in the press. And it's funny, um, Ari, when you mentioned about not wanting to, you know, organize with people who don't have, you know, some of their crap together, basically, because who wants to push against the brick wall? The thing that's so interesting is that as we choose to coalesce with other groups and other people, to achieve particular political ends or polit political acts, for example, abolishing the police, abolishing the criminal justice system. It means having to bring us into very close contact with people who are going to be all over the map with regard to where they stand on a whole array of issues. Are we willing to embrace the risk of you know, dealing in that situation? One of the issues that we constantly faced as black feminists was do we want a closed world or a larger world? And what are we willing to struggle for? What are we willing to deal with? How are we gonna deal with the homophobia coming out of the black church that we were finding whenever we were trying to do something that related to the larger black community? And we were successful in that we never capitulated and didn't, didn't back down, but the scars of being talked about and being disrespected by other black people was, <coughs> excuse me, um, daunting. Mm -hmm. And so people would leave the organization because you can't take it. You can only take so much. How do you explain to your aunt who goes to Bethel Baptist Church, that was you on the picket line supporting lesbian rights? How do you explain that? And you're maybe, and maybe as a straight woman, you're not a lesbian. So there's a lot as relates to when we think about engaging and we think about working together are we willing to engage in the risks that are involved? Because sometimes the rewards don't balance it out. Mm. Mm. I mean, <laughs> that's such a hard question. I wanna, I wanna throw it to Ari first, because I think you know there, there are two ways that you can answer it. There are so many mm -hmm. ways to answer it. So you can many it again. The question? Oh, the Oh, I was asking about disruption and Demita was also talking about, do we, do we consider the risk it takes? As it relates to disruption, are you prepared for the fallout? Are you risk embracing or risk averse? Mm -hmm. I know I'm prepared for the fallout. Yeah. I'm, I've always fought, <laughs> I've always got them hands. So like physically, I'm, I'm always ready. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was a particular instance um, that I talk about all the time here in Boston where me and you know I'm I'm a queer black woman but my boyfriend is cis he's hetero um black man mm -hmm. and, um we were attacked by the straight black pride movement and there was a it was a different type of pain um mm -hmm. 
being intentionally attacked and torn down mm. by your own people, by people. There were people part of the straight black pride movement who are in my community to this day. They're mm-hmm. still here uh, mm. showing up to a community event, still organizing. And mm-hmm. um, just to realize that there are some people who like all skin folk and kin folk and um, right. they will never recognize or want to recognize the humanity in me. I think that's really kind of like why what I said earlier, I want to reserve my empathy and care for mm-hmm. people who can see the humanity in me. That's mm-hmm. what I mean by that. Um, and so Demia, when you said that, that just really, cause that was just, that was just a different type of pain because you expect it from folks outside of your community, but you don't, ex- you, I did expect it, but it hurts differently. When That's it's right. Black, when it's another black person calling you a bed wedge, calling you a homophile, calling you all these crazy types of names because, because you're <laughs> queer. Not knowing that it's the queer and trans black women um, who made this movement, um, who oh, got you your know. rights. But that's, right. that's not something that they want to hear. And I feel like it's not always um, optional for us yeah. to choose. You yeah. know what I mean? We don't always yes. have the grace of being able to choose whether or not we're in this fight. Sometimes all you have to do is be Black and be in a place and you're in the fight. Exactly. And you have a choice. Yeah, because the uh, fight gets brought to you. <laughs> right. The fight, get, the fight gets brought to you or you're... you're already seen as a competitor in the fight because of your skin color because of how you identify sexually or gender wise um and so um yeah I'm not sure if I even answered the question but but you did yeah that that was yeah that's (laughs) that's you know I'm I'm personally very very um drawn to risk taking Mm -hmm. um no problem Mm -hmm. but for other people that is not something that they um that they have the grace of doing or even the grace of thinking or wanting right. to do. um yeah sometimes people don't know if they're risk averse or risk embracing until they get yeah. on the front lines they don't know that you, you don't know where your edges are till you find them you know what i mean right exactly exactly yeah um all right well first of all thank you for sharing that because um you know you're just super vulnerable in that moment you too demita um, thank you both for being super vulnerable in this conversation. Um, I think I, I, th- I think about it in two ways because Ari knows that I, and, and maybe Jen and Demita, you might know this about me too by now. Um, you know, it depends. It really depends, right? Because like in my mind um, and, and in my heart, I want to be big tent, right? Like I want, you know, I, I, I truly think that everyone or um, not everyone, I think most people are organizable. Um, and I think that, um, most people, if you are able to sit down and have two, three, four conversations with them, um, then they might come to maybe not even two, three, four conversations, but if you spend time with them, um, you will start to understand each other, even if that means agreeing to disagree or agreeing to non-closure, um, not necessarily about your humanity or who you are, but probably about political issues, not necessarily about, you know, some of the things that um, Ari was, Ari was um, referencing. Um, but that is like, you know, under the guise of the American political system, again, like how we reach liberation, is it through, you know, uh, economic liberation? Is it through small business? Like, you know, like that's those things that mm-hmm. we can probably say, like some of these things we could probably agree on, some of these things we could probably disagree on and, and come to some sort of consensus or, um, agree to disagree. I think mm-hmm. in general, I don't, <laughs> you know, I, I, okay, so I will say that I am from a family of people who I love, right? Like, um, but people who were organizers were around um, back in the day um, in the movement in Boston, um, as well as people who were working class, as well as people who were middle class, as well as, you know, it runs the gambit. And so um, I have seen my family, people in my family struggle Mm -hmm. um, politically and financially um, in order to save others, themselves Mm -hmm. and others. Um, Mm -hmm. I've seen people, um, I'm thinking about, you know, like especially the women in my family who have held it down for generations. Um, I'm, I, I have heard throughout my life, like, you know, you have to stay until it's done. You know, I remember when the Women's March was happening, um, being so angry that my grandmother was at the Women's March. Um, <laughs> you know, my grandmother was 80 years old. 
And, she this match. and I was angry. I was literally angry. I was like, you shouldn't have to be there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and this is in 2016. Um, and them, you know, chastising me and telling me, you know, you have to stay till the fight is over. I'm That's not right. Uh, she's, she's not her. Um, not everybody. I, th I think, you know, I'm, I'm along the same wave as Ari, where I, I'm, I believe in the humanity of every person, um, but I will wait for them to, to meet me where I'm at. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I'm not necessarily, when it, when it comes to disruption um, and how we organize with each other, I'm okay with leaving some people behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Personally. Mm -hmm. But I'm so curious, you know, so like that's, you know, that's, uh, I'm a different person. No, I really, can I just say, I really wish we were going to continue this like in the bar. I'm just joking. Okay, let me go to the bar. But, <laughs> sorry, I'm just well, revealing we, my roots. I appreciate um, so much the, the feeling of, I don't know, I'm not sure, yes and no. Mm -hmm. And also, I think for next time, I think it'd be great to pick up from this point because the issue has always been who is included in our vision for liberation mm -hmm. and who's not, and how do we how, how is that, how do we do that? How do we, what are we creating? What are we doing? And so I love that you said what you said, Sierra, about, you know, some people just might not be there because that's just always really the truth. And yet at another level, I have to say, I am an unrepentant, not giving upper. <laughs> and I also recognize that it's, not so much loving each person and like having them be my friend and not even necessarily them giving up some of their worst ways. But if we can create work together that is liberatory and that we can do that together, then there's more learning that can come from that action than I think we can always appreciate. So I'm gonna stop right there. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing place um, to pause, not entirely stop because we'll pick this up again. Um, on June 22nd, um, I uh, feel like there are so mu there's so much more to, to pick up on and I'm making that bookmark of, um, based on this question of risk-taking and, and disruption, who is included in this vision for liberation as a starting point for next time. Um, right. Ari or Sierra or Demita, do you have any closing thoughts for today or, or final, final word? No. No. Nope. To be delightfully continued. To be delightfully continued. Um, thank you, uh, Randy and, and Andrew at, at BCA for, for hosting um, and, and keeping this going. And yes, we are going to continue uh, the conversation on June 26th at 3 p.m. So much happening, happening in Boston and, and happening in the nation um, in between in these next two weeks and um, maybe more to be discussed uh, based on how these two weeks pass. Um, right. Demita, as ever, thank you so much for, uh, again, being our um, intellectual and inspirational guide on this overall project, but especially, you know, in, in conversation with you today. Oh, and I thank all of you, Sierra, Ari, Jen, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for giving me the chance. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for attending and we're excited it's recorded. We'll share out. Excellent. Bye everyone. Bye.